Transfiguration. Well, before I start, I first I have to personally apologize to Kent. Because the last time I spoke, he enjoyed my magic trick so much, he asked if this time I could saw a lady in half. <laughs> and I said, no way, that's, that's not going to work. I have to wait till I do my talk on Solomon, then I'll do it. <laughs> okay. So, transfiguration, the changing of appearances. Oh, I do have a magic trick. Not a magic trick, but it is a trick. It should be good enough for me. I happen to also have it in my pocket. Okay, you've seen these professionals do it. Don't try this at home, children. Watch my hand. Okay, a balloon and light bulb. Okay, I got another. Pear. One more. Tweety Bird. I worked hard at those. Was that good enough? Okay, thank you. So, transfiguration, changing of appearance. Um, in human terms, you know, my dad used to tell me that his doctor was always telling him he had to watch his weight. So, he told me, well, so I got it out where I could see it. <laughs> but with, with, um, with Jesus, what we're talking about is, is something slightly different. The change that occurs is something a little bit different from what we normally think about. If you think about the Hulk, muscle out and all that kind of stuff, which happens to me only once a week, and then um, uh, Transformers and all of this kind of stuff, they're changing and gaining all these superpowers and becoming these new things. And even a butterfly, to some extent, it gains new power that can fly and all this kind of stuff. Jesus... And you thought I didn't have a point with that balloon, did you? Jesus went up on the mountain and he went <laughs> and became what? Jesus. Right? Boom, bam, boom, boom, light. And he changes into Jesus. He's still Jesus. So what was the point? The transformation maybe is not so much in him, but maybe for us. And when his face was shining like the sun, if you recall back to Moses, he went and saw God, and what happened to him? His face was suntan because he was facing God. The light on him gave him a nice little tan. But Jesus' face was shining like the sun. He was the sun. The light was coming from him. And so that's something that we need to think about. Now, they go up on the mountain. And, you know, Moses also went up on the mountain. And uh, there was this big, huge cloud hanging over the mountain and all the Peter Jackson special effects are happening all around the mountain. And, then, and Moses says, oh, I'm going up there. And the people say, okay, see you, Moses. Don't forget to write. So he goes up there, and, and God writes. Right? He writes the Ten Commandments. And Moses brings it back down, which is a good thing because those big heavy stone tablets, who knows what postage would have been if he mailed it, right? So... Um, Moses had that mountaintop experience. Elijah up on the mountain, listening for God, waiting for God. God passes by, storms and all this stuff happening. They have their mountaintop experience. Jesus goes up on the mountain and he himself glows and shines. Now, P 
Peter, when he sees that, right? First thing he does when he sees that, he's like, whoa, shining light, flawless of Moses, Elijah. Hey, it's a good thing I'm here. It's like, what? What is he saying? He's thinking about him. He sees this stuff happening, and the first thing he thinks of to say is, wow, it's a good thing I'm here. I can do something about this. Sometimes I think that the, the editors of the Bible took out a verse from the Bible It was probably because it happened a lot. The same verse occurred a lot throughout the Bible. And if they left it in, it would have been, um, it would have made the Bible twice as long. And so I tried to do some research on it. And I think if I understand the translation correct, the, 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 sent, the verse that's taken out to make, keep the Bible nice and short is, and then God rolled his eyes. <laughs> and it happens a lot, you know. I mean, just before all of this, Jesus had been doing miracles, walking on water, healing people, feeding people, five, thousands of people with a few loaves of bread. And then after all these kinds of things, Jesus tells him in a serious tone, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And then Peter's guys go, oh yeah, we're out of bread. That's in the Bible. It's like, oh, yeah, it's be- I get it. It's because we forgot to bring bread. We don't ran out of bread. So then the verse right after that would have been, and then God rolled his eyes. And we do that. That's what I like about the Bible because it, it understands uh, human, human nature. We can be like that. Peter says, I can do this. And, and yeah, sure, when I see somebody glowing and shooting off light and then dead people talking, I, first thing I would think of is, oh, let me get my hammer. Where is that? And I'm going to build something. So he wants to build a temple for all three of them. And there's, there's two things wrong with that. One is that um, by doing that, what he's really trying to do is contain, to keep it to himself, to, to preserve that moment, to, say, to preserve that mountaintop experience that we don't want to leave. So he's going to build these temples right here so they can stay here and we can worship and we can hold hands and sing Kumbaya all the rest of our lives and we'll be all good. Because prior to this also, Jesus already told them what was going to happen. Right? That he would be turned over. That people would do things to him. That he would be put to death. So they knew what was coming. Peter said, no way. I'm not going to let that happen. And Jesus had to say, hey, you're not thinking about God's will, you're thinking about yourself. You must think of the things of God. What I'm telling you needs to happen. And not, not long after that, they're up on the mountain and Peter's still thinking the same way. Build something. Well, the other thing too is that building three temples, he's not connecting that Moses and Elijah, important as they were, are not Jesus. And Jesus is different. And God takes a time at this point because Peter's still running around. Oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to build this. Hmm, maybe, maybe windows would be nice, something. Uh, so throw pillows and mirrors and all this kind of stuff. But God actually has to interrupt him and say, hey. He interrupts Peter and says, this is my son, my beloved. I love him. Listen to him. And then, boom, they fall on the ground. So it wasn't the lights, it wasn't dead people talking, it was the loud booming voice of God. Now, I had that experience one time. I have a good, nice, booming voice of God. So one day, Sarah was running, running to where she wasn't supposed to run, and I couldn't grab her because she is fast. And she was running, and I said, Sarah, Sarah, and she kept running. So I go, Sarah, and boom, she hits the ground, just from the power of my voice. So, you know, maybe that's what it took. That he, and God had to basically shake him and say, hey, okay, I gave you all the miracles. I gave you all this stuff. Pharisees were asking for evidence. Blah, blah, blah. I did all that stuff. Here, let me just tell you already. Jesus is my son. He's not Moses. He's not Elijah. He's not a good man. He's not a good teacher. He's not a moral person. He's not, he's not a, a, a wise teacher, a guru. He's not even a prophet. He is my son. He's the son of God. 
I love him. Listen to him. Stop. Stop talking. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add, add more things to this church. I'm going to hang strobe lights and, and mirror balls and things. God says, stop. First, stop. Be still. Listen. And listen to Jesus. He is my son. And that's what we need to do. And that's what they needed to do in order to realize that Jesus had the power over death. Jesus had the power to overcome what was going to come, what he already told them was going to happen. Jesus didn't change. Jesus, boom, becomes Jesus. Jesus showed that he was God. He was God's son. He was with God from the beginning. Jesus didn't change. Remember, Jesus was the word of God when? In the beginning. Jesus was the light of the world when? In the beginning. So he was all that. That light wasn't something new, wasn't something he achieved or earned or gained or got. It was there all the time from the beginning of the world. So his powers were already there through, through all creation. So then how do we live? What is, what is that for us? Well, for the disciples, it was at first they had to wait. He told them to wait. But once he gave the signal, boom, they spread out and they went and they, and, and, and they shared their little light. They went and talked about it. For us, it's that understanding. Same as for them. It gave them understanding God's true power, who Jesus really is, gave them the strength the assurance that, yes, he's the one, gave them the hope of what is to come, that we will be like him, and gave them the strength to endure what was surely to follow. For us, in our daily lives, in our family and friends, the struggles that are ahead, we know those things are not going to change. We've gone up to the mountaintop. I, was, I grew up a Southern Baptist. We'd go to those camps. We'd sing the songs. We'd have people give their lives over to God and all of that kind of stuff. And it was beautiful and it was great and it was wonderful. But when we go back to the real world, when we come back from the mountaintop, it's hard to hold on to that. Right? So we want to keep going back. But the problem with keep, keeping on going back is then, is it a once a year thing? Is it a once a week thing? Am I only in there, in that spirit, in that feeling when I'm there? And Pastor Leah asks us always, where do you see the face of God? She doesn't say, can you go up to the mountain and look for the face of God and then report back to us? She is asking you every day in your everyday lives, where do you see the face of God? Because if we can do that, then we don't need to wait for the mountaintop experience. We don't have to wait and go up there. It's good to do that. It's good to do the retreats. It's good to, to do those things, to fellowship with others, to help each other, to really strengthen each other and support each other. But we can do that more frequently if, as Pastor Leah says, we look for it in our everyday lives. And we can do that with the assurance that God is the power, that God will save us, that God loves us, and that we can walk with him through anything and get to the other side because we have seen a glimpse of al already of what is on the other side. And that transfiguration transforms into us because the other time that word is used, the root word for that transfiguration, the transformation, is when Paul reminds us that do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. So, it's not just Jesus transfiguring, right? He's showing us. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we ourselves can be transformed to be who we were meant to be, to be part of Jesus' legacy, to be part of that light. And if we can carry that with us throughout the day, throughout the week, then we don't have to wait for mountaintop experiences. We can come down and share it with the world. Amen. Well, this light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This 
Let my 